Well, I'm going to talk about uh, issues around sort of systems of things, uh, obviously the aggregation of a lot of uh, high-tech uh, components, the, the internet of things. And uh, I just wanted to say before that, and I'm, I'm a sort of hopeful Lloyd's Register Foundation grant receiver, but we've, that's yet to be confirmed, but uh, there's an interest in what we're doing here. But what I would like to say is that Lloyd's Register Foundation, wearing my hat as the president of the Institution of Engineering and Technology, we've got a great initiative which I'd encourage you to back, find out about, and that's the Horizons Bursary, which is for uh, disadvantaged and people who are coming from other disciplines into engineering. Uh, so people coming through apprenticeships or coming from uh, difficult backgrounds uh, and so on to help them get into engineering. Uh, Lloyd's Register have, uh, I think, promised us 12 bursaries over this year. And uh, as president, I've undertaken to try and find uh, support for 75. So you've helped me a lot actually already, which is great. Um, so moving off on the Internet of Things, this presentation was derived from one that I gave to the Home Office. It was a, an international crime and policing conference. And so it, it does focus on some of the risks uh, and articulates those quite clearly because obviously cybersecurity is really the core of this. But uh, the Internet of Things in itself is, is a huge opportunity. And in fact, I'll talk a little bit later about the Blackett Review, which was uh, commissioned by the government chief scientific advisor, uh, Sir Mark Walpert, a couple of years ago and really focused on maximizing the economic benefits of the Internet of Things, uh, not rather than the negative side of it. So as you can see there, the very broad definition, there's a, a link to big data and, and data analytics, because these are sources of data and sinks of data. Um, we're familiar with some of the smart technologies that make previously unintelligible things like uh, home automation systems. We're probably familiar with Hive and Nest and all those sorts of things, but they communicate wirelessly. They're typically machine-to-machine -machine communications. Humans aren't in the loop. You don't know what they're saying to each other. And by 2020, experts reckon that we're going to have a huge number, certainly many more than there are people on the planet, of these, these devices talking to each other. So the possibility of hacking into Internet of Things networks by humans or indeed by machine agents is something that is very significant. It brings cyber threats and uh, new crime at the low level and national security issues as well. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about, about those uh, in due course. So um, you can see the reference there, uh, the Internet of Things making the most of the second digital re revolution. It's available on the web. Uh, it's a PDF. Uh, and obviously, you can get it in print as well. And that's the, the Blackett Review, which I'll uh, talk about a little bit later on just to give you a link to it. So the types of devices that I considered when the Home Office asked me to talk about this, and, and which I'll talk a little bit more, as Ruth mentioned, about Petras, which is the the hub of researchers who are working on, on looking to alleviate the issues of cybersecurity or the risks around Internet of Things. Um, this is the sort of context. So the things that are pretty obvious, like Wi-Fi, linking to routers, local wireless networks like Zigbee, Bluetooth, and there are things like, uh, in fact, LoRa, which is used for Internet of Things as well, and, and, and several other uh, protocols, many other protocols. Then the, the cellular phone technology, G3 and G4, and indeed G5 now coming through. One of our partners is working on that. So smart meters will be connected by those networks. Um, and I think one of our major sponsors in Petras, Telefonica, is going to be responsible for about 65% of those smart meter connections. There's some really interesting things around that. You know, if people could intercept those connections, there's, there's risk in many ways. Then the stuff that you kind of don't think about, you know, your PayWave card, your credit card, is in fact a sort of Internet of Things device. It's interrogated by um, medium frequency 30 megahertz signals from a reader, and it, it's obviously also interceptable, and there are, are people who actually do skim your card. So if you're standing on a tube train, potentially you can have your sk card skimmed by somebody with a, a machine uh, who can read the details. And then, of course, there are also wired connections, um, which arguably, although... Internet of Things shouldn't be defined by wireless. These are direct connections. And USB devices, I've got one or two examples which may make your hair stand on end later uh, around that area. So the Blackett Reviews are commissioned typically to look at issues of, of national security uh, by the government chief scientific advisor and may produce an out some outcomes may be in the, you know, in the security domain and not published and other outcomes are in the public domain. Uh, typically investigations into matters of national importance and uh, IoT was seen to be one of those issues that needed to be looked at. I believe you had uh, Lord Willits here this morning, David Willits, who was uh, a close colleague when I was a, 
uh, government chief scientific advisor, and of course he came up with the eight great technologies plus two, and one of the two was IoT and the other one was uh, quantum, uh, and both of those have attracted uh, Research Council funding. So the report from the Internet of Things you can see there, and I'm sure the, uh, the presentation can be distributed later, is available for you to read, and it covered a number of areas, and here they are, um, transport, healthcare, energy, agriculture, and buildings. And I think with the exception, maybe we have actually have got some work going on in agriculture, the Petras uh, Internet of Things Cybersecurity Hub is looking at all of those, those things. So it's, it's a real challenge to try and cover such a broad territory, boiling the sea, um, and one has to deal with it in a certain way, which, which I will come on to later as to how we've tried to tackle that by sampling some of those application areas. So I mentioned uh, diverse and pervasive applications. Here's a little bit more detail. Smart thermostats, white goods, fridges that report how full the shelves are to your, uh, either, uh, you know, to the supplier perhaps. Televisions that know your preferences. Uh, building management systems is an area I'm particularly interested in. Building management systems, which are sort of computers that run buildings. So every major building, and even, even your home these days, will have some form of processing device which is scheduling the heating, the cooling, maybe access control as well in a building, or vertical transport lifts and elevators, so on and so forth. And, and those systems have been kind of below the radar with respect to cybersecurity, but they're very vulnerable typically because they haven't been designed with cybersecurity in mind, much as enterprise systems in, in information technology are. Industrial and utilities control systems, energy suppliers, water companies, and so on. Then medical and hospital equipment uh, typically uh, are, are conditioned wirelessly as well by short or long range, patient monitors, etc. cetera. Uh, transport, Increasingly, so national uh, services like uh, Network Rail uh, use a lot of IoT-type devices. And, of course, in retail, increasingly, both uh, RFID-type tags, radio frequency identification, also point-of-sale terminals, and so on. So there's plenty of examples around and plenty of vulnerability there that we need to understand and deal with. So this fits into the context of big data, as I said earlier on. Um, we're looking at a sort of continuum of scale from object data through assemblies of objects, subsystems, buildings, and ultimately cities. Uh, and all those things come together now. It's possible to fuse data and get insights and inferences that weren't previously available. And some of those inferences, of course, have security implications, like occupancy of buildings, knowing the patterns of occupancy, and so on and so forth. Um, the Open Data Institute um, has sponsored private sector sort of mashing services to derive information from, for example, geolocated devices and to create maps of particular things like crime in certain areas or energy usage or whatever. So again, this inference capability through the big data context. And there are some interesting things like social network feeds where there was an example that norovirus, the vomiting virus, which is, is very, very infectious, is more accurately tracked by social and, and Twitter feeds, if you like, than by reports from local health authorities because people are twittering, I'm feeling unwell, you know, I've just been next to a person who's been sick over my newspaper, or whatever it might be, something of that sort of nature. So there's other things that you can pick up and fuse from social network feeds. Data integration in cities is, is pervasive now. Energy efficiency of buildings, I mentioned social data being uh, looked at. Flooding, simulation, uh, multiple agendas used for development planning in, in cities. And again, there are real vulnerabilities, and I've been involved in some conversations around what should be made public and what needs to be restricted in making, say, computer-aided design data available in cities, and then making uh, public consultations possible involving the citizen as well. They can log on at home and, and just see what uh, planning consequence might be. Within buildings, there's a, there's a very strong implication, and this is a, a slide that uh, I took from uh, an Intel presentation, so you can start to see the sort of things that you might be monitoring inside a building. The sensors, uh, the routers are involved, uh, your personal devices are involved, the cloud may be involved, and there are various levels very in, in that stack of things where there are vulnerabilities for, for inter intervention and, and hacking. And this was <laughs> avoiding the thief stealing your cloud data in this particular instance. So the type of threat that um, we're interested in, in in the Petras project are, you think first of all about information theft, and I guess insurance companies are particularly interested in that because there are particular penalties per data record that's lost. And this is the old traditional thing around the sort of standard IT. But of course for the Internet of Things, it's a different set of 
of, of, of sensitivities. And I mentioned building occupancy and the utilisation. So if you know when a building is being occupied because the IoT sensors that uh, sense whether somebody's in a room to turn the lights on and off or the heating, if that were intercepted and used by, say, you know, organised crime, you'd know when to break in and you'd know when the building was occupied and so on and so forth. Um, even more disturbing is the perturbation of operation uh, situation. So, for example, to give you the worst case, uh, or one of the worst cases, I guess, it, businesses have uh, server rooms. Those server rooms generate a lot of heat. The heat is pumped away with heat pumps, heating ventilation systems. And if those are hacked into and turned off remotely, a business can be taken offline, say, within half an hour. The computers will trip out and over temperature. And this is a real vulnerability that a lot of companies really haven't thought about and, uh, and, and it do cause uh, concern. Similarly, corruption and falsification of, uh, of, of data, sensor data. I mentioned smart meters, so energy theft by hacking into the data streams from those maybe, spoofing uh, building management systems. And I think that, and this was a topic actually that came up in, the, in, the, in my mind anyway in the Lloyd's Register advisory board yesterday, the, the supply chain issues around falsification of information just to take you to a particular point, the product provenance. So if you think about pharmaceuticals, how do you know that the drug's been sourced from a certain place is actually the, the, the drug that you think you're buying if you're a pharmaceutical or a, a commissioning body? And how do you know the aerospace part to fit in your jet engine is actually from the place that you think it was? You know, it will have some form of provenance information associated with it, maybe electronically, and these are things we need to think about. So, because I'm rushing off to, uh, go, to go to a, a conference in Birmingham very shortly for the IET. I'm going to have to hurry on. So I'm, I'm going to talk about each of those things in turn, but I won't spend time on that particular slide. So I mentioned uh, contactless uh, snooping near field communications. So most of our cards these days have, if you like, a small processor built in. When you bring your card close to a reader, energy flows across from the reader into the card, it energizes the chip. The chip then uh, signals to the reader your credentials and so on and the transaction is, is cleared through and that's something so essentially you're exposing your identity or the identity of your card whenever a reader is, is about and those readers you know might be deployed covertly in somebody's uh, pocket and, and brought up against your your pocket or your handbag or whatever so crime happens in crowded locations uh, the range of this sort of interaction is quite short five centimeters or less uh, and, you know, I used to smile when I saw adverts in, uh, in the paper saying aluminium foil wallets, you know, to, to prevent theft. But in fact, probably quite a good idea. I'd prefer a bit of copper and ferrite as well, but uh, nevertheless, uh, a useful thing to think about. Hacking into building management systems was something I touched on. IBM have a, an ethical hacking team, and essentially they go to a client and they ask, can we try and get into your system? Can we get, try and get into your enterprise? And this particular story, which is well documented in that link, and, and any sort of technical person interested in, in cyber hacking uh, should look at it. What they did was to go in through the building management system uh, and the installer had set uh, the building management system with a password, which was password, would you believe, as they often do, or zero, 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 or, or nothing. And they got in through that. And through the building management system, they weren't so interested in, in doing the perturbation I mentioned earlier on. What they were interested in was getting into the enterprise system. So through the building management system, they got into a router because the installer of the BMS thought it would be really convenient when I'm in the building, if I need to adjust something, I can do it from anyone's uh, workstation. So in fact, he had connected it to the enterprise system via a router, who, which similarly had a very weak password. And once they were through both those passwords, they were into the enterprise system. So through a remote connection into the building management system, they had access to the data files of the whole organization. And this is a, you know, it's a case study about cyber hygiene, I would call it, which is one of our Petras topics. It's half of it is behavioral, this whole problem, and half of it is technical. Smart toys, we don't think about smart toys very much, or at least I didn't until uh, you know, I started researching this, but these are increasingly uh, available, and there's a, a smart Barbie, for example, as you can see there. Um, and these may include cameras, geolocation systems, so you know, kids could be at risk from these toys, particularly if they've been hacked into and, and malware has been loaded onto them. Uh, and people like the NSPCC are one of our partners in the Petras project and are very keen for us to research more into this area just to understand the degree of risk and so on. The police force also, the Met, are very interested in that. Many, many of you will be aware of the baby monitor situation. I think it was a, a Russian hacker of a few years ago who proved that it was possible to hack into poorly 
protected internet connected uh, baby monitors, which people would typically use, you know, to view on their mobile device when they're away and the babysitter's in, you know, the, the, whether the baby's okay, etc. But I think they published, you know, a number of pictures of live streams from uh, baby monitors. Clearly, uh, you know, the, the thing there was le less about extortion, but more about just proving they could do it. But it's, it's a really concerning and, and quite disturbing thing uh, and could be used to harass and extort. Smart TVs, again, not very long ago, you may recall that Samsung put out a customer warning that they couldn't guarantee that anything that you said in front of your TV wasn't being picked up by nefarious people somewhere because, in fact, the system that obviously had a camera, maybe it had gesture recognition, as many TVs have these days, uh, didn't have a secure system and people could hack in and, and hijack data that was coming out of that. And again, in, in, in the Petras project, we've got a, a law firm, Pinsent Masons, who are very interested in the, in the governance and legal issues. Who's responsible? Who's, whose liability is this? You know, uh, it, it's a very interesting question. It becomes even more acute when you think about autonomous vehicles, which is another one of my uh, discussion points. Now, here's the scary bit that really leapt out at me when I was on a, a platform with an Intel uh, security specialist. And he said... We found when we did some work in the lab that actually things like vaping sticks that you plug into your USB port to charge the batteries were actually doing a bit more than charging batteries. They were stuffing uh, malware down into the computer. So, and so many these days of devices like little fans you can plug in or coffee mug warm warmers, we just need to be mindful of the fact that anything you plug into a USB port, USB is a lot more than power. It's also a backdoor into your computer. Uh, and this was proven with certain, US, with certain vaping sticks, clearly, uh, you know, it, I'm sure very few or maybe only one or two particular brands did have this characteristic. So you know, vigilance, I guess, is the key word there. And the healthcare devices, there's a range all the way through in terms of criticality from Fitbits and so on and, and jaw bones or whatever, right the way through to uh, infusion pumps that may be keeping your whole you know, life going. Uh, a really interesting area. At the low end, where you might say, well, I don't really care who sees my data, it may well be that your personal data, when um, aligned with other lifestyle information, you know, could be sold to insurers, for example. You might have your personal, uh, you know, some of your personal data infringed and, 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 and outcomes could be bad for you in that way. Obviously, heart pacemakers and so on are very potentially vulnerable, but they're typically uh, affected by near-field communications and are, are much harder to hack into. Smart domestic appliances, um, I've mentioned most of these issues, so occupancy detection, facilitating burglary, um, snooping on usage uh, patterns, and just hacking for the sake of it because it needs to prove that you can do it, which increasingly happens. This, I guess, is an area of, of significant interest to Lloyd's Register, and that's about cars now and in the future. So current vehicles typically use a, a controller area network, CAN network in the car. It's typically connected to the entertainment system, but it's also connected to the braking system, the engine management system. And there have been uh, studies and trials done to prove that you can actually hack in through the communication system if you know what you're doing into, say, braking and, and, and disable some of the systems in the car to the obvious detriment of safety. And as we go towards autonomous vehicles, which have and require the combination of onboard electronics and sensing with external cloud-based information and GPS. Increasingly, there's, there's space there to be researched. You know, one wouldn't want to raise un unnecessary concerns, but there's a real area to be understood properly in that area. So um, the whole challenge really is about the interaction between social and, and physical sciences and how we manage the interdependencies, how we understand the language between those two sides. Uh, looking at standards and protocols, looking at business models, as well as all the technology behind it, which is the simple engineering answer, let's make the technology secure, but actually it's about behaviours as much as, as technology. And so there are some quality questions in social sciences about how users perceive cyber risk, and of course ones in physical science and engineering, the quality of standards and protocols, the physics, if you like, of shortwave, short-range propagation, uh, detecting anomalies in machine-to-machine -machine communications. How can you monitor what's going on, say, in a building management system to be sure that it's doing what you expect it to do and not something that is being perturbed by another agency? Um, so there are some policy challenges. I won't go through those now because I wanted to talk just very briefly about the Petras project, which is the one that is being funded by EPSRC using DCMS money, Department of Culture, Media and Sport. Um, it's part of... Um, I, you can look at these links in, in, in due course. 
So Petras, uh, which, uh, as you can see, is privacy, ethics, trust, reliability, acceptability, and security for the Internet of Things, um, is from uh, EPSRC, DCMS, and we've attracted more external funding than we've got from government. So we've got about a £23 million program over three years, a lot of very high-intensity work, with some key outcomes to look at co-produced deployable solutions. It's not just about quality research, it's actually about best practice studies, both for behavioral and technical uh, deployment. And it's organized around um, some streams and it's got some key players. So in the hub, we have uh, UCL, this is interesting. <laughs> Did that happen on, on your screen? So UCL is leading with Imperial, Lancaster, Oxford, and Warwick. Warwick has got key information and knowledge around building security. Um, we've got some spoke partners who've got distinct individual expertise, Cardiff on internet security, Edinburgh on design for behavioral outcomes, Southampton on the uh, internet, uh, sorry, the uh, in Internet of Things Observatory, and Surrey on G5, um, 5G technologies. And we've got over 50 public and private sector partners, including Lloyd's Register and, and others. Um, the key facts then, we've essentially got uh, activities and challenge streams, We've got privacy and trust, safety and security, economic values, standards, governance and policy, and adoptability and acceptability as the key deliverables. And we've sampled those through sectoral interests in the middle there that you can see. Uh, I've mentioned most of the other information there, I think. So this is probably a convenient point to close. Um, I could go on and talk about the individual sectoral areas, but that's more detailed. Uh, suffice it to say, we're sampling each of those sectoral areas with two or three projects. So we've got this boiling the sea problem, divided it by sectors, and then we've sampled each of those sectors with two or three projects that I think give overall reasonable coverage. And we strongly invite and have had many partners come to our, uh, to our meetings uh, and, and to ask to participate since the, the bid went in. So we're very open to further interest and conversation on this matter. Thank you very much. Burning question in the audience. Um, I think uh, over there is Annie. Fascinating presentation. I'm just wondering, from a personal perspective, you know, we're seeing the rate with Internet of Things of technological development going up like this. You've outlined very clearly the struggles that we're having in terms of of, of make, managing potential risks to this. Do you think? given this rate and our current struggles to, to manage and given human behaviour, we're in danger of getting a complete disconnect and, and a chaotic landscape emerging in, in, in the next 20 years in terms of policing and protecting ourselves against threats. I think there is that danger if we don't uh, take the right, if you like, voluntary and maybe regulatory uh, and standards-based approaches. I mean, one of the things that I think about is we encourage SMEs, absolutely wonderful, but you, know, you can imagine an SME with a wonderful Internet of Things device going to market, uh, getting devices made in China, maybe 100,000 devices, selling them, and then failing in the marketplace. Who's going to support those devices? They may be you know, quite critical in, in some ways, and there should be, could be some real vulnerabilities. So I think the qualification of devices, much as we see eMark, forgive me for using that term in a Brexit environment, but nevertheless, we, we, we have an imprimatur which guarantees a certain level of assessment which is valuable, certainly for electrical safety. Maybe we need to do something similar for security safety. Okay. Thank you very much, okay. Jeremy. Thanks. Thanks.